find it, then you guys are going to have to tell us what the questions are. Okay. I think. Hi, everybody. I want to welcome you to the American Dental Assistance Association Facebook Live event for our town hall this month. Hi, everybody, right? My name is Cherie Busby, and I am your hostess for our event this evening. And I have a couple of friends with me, right? So, Sarah, tell us who you are. Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Stream. I am an infection preventionist and a dental assistant. And I live um, close to Omaha, Nebraska. Um, I am very active on the national level in the ADAA. And we are going to talk to you today about infection control and respiratory protection and membership. Rock on, thanks. We have somebody else with us too. Anna, tell us about yourself. Hi everyone, my name is Anna. I'm on the social media committee here at the ADA. A, and then I'm also your newly elected 11th district trustee, so I'm really excited to get more involved and meet all you wonderful members and connect with you in the upcoming year. So that's awesome. Pretty cool. I know. I'm so happy to be here with my two friends and that we're going to have some really great things for you tonight. I know I said my name is Sheree Busby and uh, I am on the member committee for the association. I'm also uh, a board member or a vice president, I guess, secretary, I don't know what I am anyway, for the Illinois Dental Assistance Association. And um, I do dental assistant education on my other job. So tonight we have a really great lineup for you. Uh, we want to do an introduction to you to our brand new president, uh, Miss Betty Fox, that got uh, just elected last week. So she's already um, created a time for us to be there. And then like Sarah said, we've got a, a, an agenda lined up for us for everything we're gonna do tonight, right? So Sarah, tell us about our newly elected members, our board members. Yeah, so we have um, our newly elected president is Betty Fox, like Cherie said. Our incoming president-elect is Ms. Sue Kamizzi. We have Ms. Kathy Roberts as vice president. Sarah Sorka as secretary, and Miss Robin Rixey as immediate past president. That's awesome. We are so excited that these, these ladies have stepped forward um, to help us carry our organization on through the next couple of years. So it's a really exciting thing for them. So we do have a welcome from our new president, Betty Fox, and we'll see if our our behind the scenes magician there, um, Peter, can play that video for us. And you guys bear with us. We've had a little bit of technical trouble coming on here tonight. Hello, right? everyone. <laughs> I'd like to welcome you to our Facebook Live event this evening. I'm Betty That's Fox, awesome. president of the American Dental Assistance Association. I live in the Knoxville, Tennessee area. I've been a certified dental assistant since As we're going through the thing, our program tonight, we have about maybe 45 minutes of stuff like of content that we'd like to share with you guys. But please, this is all about you. We want to be able to answer any questions that you may have. We want to, uh, so chat away with us. We're all three watching the live stream on Facebook so we can capture your questions and answer them. We're here to do that. And I got to tell you, if we don't know the answer, which... <laughs> Sometimes we may not, right? We don't know the answer, then uh, we will reach out and, and like connect with us so we can um, get that answer for you. So if you do have a question, you can send an email to the adaausa.com and go on there and do contact us and send us a question. Um, and then we will get back to you with whatever the answer is that if we, we don't know. Um, and it's bound to happen, right? And especially in a live event, you're waiting for a video and you don't know what's going to happen. And so you never know, right? Everything's going to be there. But we are so excited. Go ahead. Oh. Okay. Well, you want to go ahead and live stream for us. I mean, do our share our screen. And then we'll get started. Okay. And then we'll hear from. 
We'll hear from Betty in just a little bit, okay? So first up, Miss Anna is going to talk to us about, oh, look, there's Miss Betty. Rock Betty. on. Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to our Facebook Live event this evening. I'm Betty Fox, president of the American Dental Assistance Association. Well, let's hope it's streaming loud. Okay. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to our Facebook Live event this evening. I'm Betty Fox, president of the American Dental Assistance Association. I live in the Knoxville, Tennessee area. I've been a certified dental assistant since 1978, and I'm a life member of the ADAA. I'd like to invite you to join the ADAA and be a part of your professional organization. Thank you for attending, and I hope you enjoy what's been planned for you tonight. All right. Thanks to Miss Betty, right? That was awesome. Thanks, Peter, for getting awesome. that up for us, right? She, um, she's a delightful woman, and I'm, I'm looking forward to getting to know her better. So uh, our topics, like Sarah said earlier, we're going to talk to you about, one, we are the American Dental Assistance Association and very proud to be um, active participants, and, and um, we work hard for this organization. So Anna's going to talk to us about um, all the uh, benefits of being able to be in the association, and then uh, from that, then Sarah's going to talk to you about infection control, and then I'm going to round out the evening with respiratory protection. So as we go through the program, you guys, please ask your questions and then um, we'll, we're right there to help you, okay? All right, I think that Peter was uh, screen sharing for us. So if I wanna kind of get started there. And uh, awesome, there you go. Okay, Anna, take us away. All right, hello everybody. So tonight I'm gonna talk to you guys about membership, fellowship and mastership. Um, so everything that we have going on to offer at the ADAA. So whenever you are ready for the next slide. So at the ADAA mission statement is against the careers of dental assistants and to advocate for the dental assisting profession in matters of education, professional activities, credentialing and legislation to promote the ideals and growth of the association, which aid in the accessibility and delivery of quality oral health care to the public. So who can be a member? So dental assistants, dental front office staff, and dental students. I actually started in 2012 as a student member, and here I am, how awesome. So we have multiple types of memberships. We have student, professional, life professional, emeritus, and international. So the ADAA offers a lot of membership benefits, so many that I couldn't fit them all on two slides. So, um, but I will go over some of them with you. So one of the, my favorite ones is the free continuing education. It's available online 24 seven. And just to be able to have that at your disposal, you know, especially after work and stuff is, you know, you can't always go to a conference. So to be the ability to be able to have it at your fingertips is just amazing. We also get professional liability coverage over 50 K worth. Um, free dental assistant journal subscription that comes out monthly in our newsletters. We have scholarships and award eligibilities for our students and our um, life members. Uh, we have membership in states and local chapters. And then you also have the opportunity to hold state and um, local and national levels um, and volunteer positions. Additional benefits include $2,000 worth of accidental death and dismemberment insurance. We have access to supplemental short-term vision and dental plans, job search um, resources using dentalworkers.com. We give our members membership pins and plaques that are available. And then we also have fellowship and mastership programs. So in addition, um, we have 
a huge discount. So we have short-term medical insurance plans. Um, like I mentioned on the last slide, the dental and vision savings plans, prescription savings plans, uh, Office Depot, Office Max discounts, hearing aid savings plans, EPA compliance software, identity theft protection. You get discounts on scrubs. You have discounts on travel, including flights, car rentals, and hotels. And then you also have a special Orlando vacation deal where you can get discounts on tickets from Disney and Universal Studios and the surrounding hotels and vacation homes in the area, which is really nice for conferences or just family vacations in general. And to see the full list um, of our membership benefits, please visit adaausa.org. So our ADAA Fellowship is our program and a level of professional achievement amongst our members. There are two paths, um, either clinical or business, you can take to get here. You're recognized for your accomplishment among your peers. It increases the value to your patients in your practice. Um, you have over 300 approved CE courses, but if you're already a Danby certified dental assistant, 150 hours will be added towards your fellowship credit, which is amazing. And so this is currently available to all ADAA members. And upon completion and attending, you will attend a convocation ceremony at an ADAA national meeting. I'm so excited. I have about 10 hours left to get my fellowship. Oh, so. oh wow, that's awesome, I'm, Sarah. I, I'm right Congrats. behind you. I, don't, I have more than 10, but not that much. So <laughs> yay, we'll be together. I'm so excited. Yeah. <laughs> that is awesome, ladies. Okay, so next up is our ADA mastership. So this is what comes after our fellowship. So it's expansion of topics that you studied previously in your fellowship. You get an additional 400 hours of approved continuing education and volunteer opportunities. It leads to advanced knowledge and increases the value to your patients and to the dental practice that you work at. Public recognition of professional achievement. You can have increased self-esteem available to all current ADAA fellows. And then you also are allowed to attend a convocation ceremony at the ADA national meeting. It's a big deal. How many fellow, I mean, how many masters are there? Like 25 or 27, right? Not very many. Not very many. It's a very elite right. group, right? That's mm -hmm. pretty awesome. Very, very. Yep. Oh, and so fun for tonight and all the way through Sunday, we are offering a special offer for everybody that's watching this live video right now. So um, we're gonna give $25 off our national membership dues. So this is for new members or any past member who hasn't renewed within the last three years. You can visit the link. Um, we will drop it in the comments below because I know you can't click on the screen. Um, fill out the application and ask you to send it back to Ms. Porter before November the 8th. And we'll drop the link and the um, email address, fax number, all in the comments for you guys. And then we want you guys to get social with us. So like, follow, and subscribe. We have a new YouTube channel that we're trying to build up. So um, if you guys could go and give us some love on that, we can't change our channel name until we get a thousand subscribers. So go like and share, and we are excited to get some new content up for you guys in the upcoming year. We are. You guys have to check it out. I did a video with a head covering on. Like, come on. I got, I got like up there to do respiratory protection. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> There's some fun stuff on the YouTube channel, for sure. There is, right? We're so excited. It's not, we haven't had it very long, but it's, it's starting to gain traction. So like and share and upload a video. We'd love to see what you guys yeah. are doing. Right? That's and, awesome, Anna. Thank you. And just watching the comments, I want to give a shout out to there are quite a few people on here that are just completing Denise. or have just completed their fellowship and mastership. So you guys are awesome. Keep up wow. the good work. Yeah. Congrats. Um, you know, I've been so busy with work lately that I haven't had time to take any dental classes, which is really sad for me. I love dental classes. Um, all right, so we will keep rolling. The next section we're going to talk about is infection control during the COVID-19 pandemic. So 
As I mentioned earlier, I am an infection preventionist. I've been a dental assistant since 2007. I was a dental assisting educator for some years in there. And last December, I graduated with my master's of public health. So I was lucky enough to make it on to an infection prevention team in the state of Nebraska. And I get to use both my dental skills and my public health infection control skills. So it's very exciting for me. Um, so I just wanted to bring you guys some updates on the latest COVID-19 guidance. So the CDC is regularly, regularly updating their dental guidance on their website. So the last time they updated the guidance was of August 28th. So it's been a hot minute. Um, the biggest changes in that update were um, the definition of a fever. So you're looking now at a fever of 100.4 or greater or a subjective fever. That's the big change. So a subjective fever would be if somebody came in and they say, I feel warmer than normal, even though they may not be at that 100.4 degrees that would still be considered a subjective fever and be enough for you to send them home. Um, they have also updated that wearing eyewear with large gaps. Um, I have to move my camera so I can see the slides there. There we go. Wearing eyewear with large gaps likely doesn't actually protect your eyes from those splashes and spatters. So if you're wearing prescription eyeglasses like this that have big gaps in them, things can get in. So you need to make sure you're wearing approved safety glasses, or if you have to wear your prescription eyeglasses, get side shields and wear a face shield with that. And then there was additional guidance added for physical distancing as well. So making sure that you're staying at least six feet apart when you're in those social situations and in your office, unless you're doing some treatment on a patient. Look at you, Peter, you're right on cue with the next slide. Um, all right, so next I wanted to talk about aerosol generating procedures. This is a topic of hot debate right now because there really isn't a good definition for what an aer aerosol generating procedure is. So the CD, in the CDC definition, they state that there is no consensus on what specific procedures could create aerosols. So I know some offices are considering, um, you know, doing a profi or a coronal polish that would be considered an aerosol generating procedure. Some offices aren't considering that an aerosol generating procedure. But in general, any procedure that includes the use of an ultrasonic scaler, a high speed handpiece, an air water syringe, or an air polisher or air abrasion should be considered aerosol generating. So if you guys are using any of those things, then you need to make sure you're taking those appropriate COVID precautions. You can go to the next slide now. Perfect. Um, so as far as PPE goes, we need to make sure that we're wearing it appropriately. If you don't wear your PPE appropriately, it is not effective, okay? So if you're wearing your masks, masks need to cover both your nose and your mouth at all times. I know we see, you know, we're out and about in the community and you go to the grocery store and there's the kid working behind the counter and he's got his mask down under his nose, not doing anything for him, okay? So making sure that we're protecting ourselves by covering our mouth and our nose with our masks. If you're wearing respirators, making sure they're fitted properly, um, which Cherie is going to talk about a lot more in detail here coming up, but even finding respirators right now is a difficult task. So when you find them, sometimes you have to make do with what you have. And there are some tips and tricks to make sure you get a proper seal that Cherie is gonna talk about later. And then making sure we're wearing our eyewear and a face shield in high risk areas and during those aerosol generating procedures. So you work in an office and let's say you're just doing maybe an, taking an x-ray really quick on a patient. That isn't an aerosol generating procedure. So you don't necessarily need to be wearing your face shield and a respirator to take a PA of number eight. But if you're in doing a filling where you're going to be using a high-speed handpiece or using a cabotron or crown prep, something like that that is creating a lot of aerosols, you need to make sure you're wearing those 
those proper PPE and wearing them appropriately to help protect yourself. So right now, these are the CDC PPE recommendations for high risk areas. So it is preferred that you have a face shield and goggles and your N95 or higher respirator if you can get it, okay? We need to have our isolation gown and your pair of gloves, just like you would normally. Acceptable alternative to that is replacing the N95 respirator with a surgical mask, okay? I've seen a lot of people are wearing like a level one surgical mask over their respirator to help with extended use. That's only appropriate if you're in a crisis capacity situation. So if you have enough respirators for your team to change them out like they should be, then you don't need to do that. But if you're down to one respirator per person per week for the next three weeks, then yes, you need to talk about some of those crisis capacity strategies and extending the use of those respirators. Okay, you can go to the next slide, please. So when we talk about infection control right now, it's kind of the wild west out there. Um, you know, PPE is hard to find. Respirators are hard to find. Um, gowns are hard to find. And it is all because of the supply chain disruption that happened during the beginning of the COVID pandemic. So we import a lot of that stuff from China and there aren't a lot of manufacturers in the United States that make those things for us. And the ones that do have been doing their best. And a lot of that has been allocated to the healthcare side of things, to hospitals that are in need and you know, long-term care facilities that are in need. And dental's kind of been put on the back burner. So if you have a supplier that is currently getting you the PPE you need, stay with them, okay? Don't jump to another supplier because they're the latest and greatest and they have some swing and deal going on because it may not last. If you have a good solid supply of PPE from somebody, just keep getting it from them. That's your best bet right now. Uh, on top of PPE availability, disinfectant is becoming hard to find, especially disinfectant wipes. So the wipes are actually made out of the same thing that they make gowns out of. It's called melt blown. So not only is that supply chain disrupted, but the manufacturers are allocating those wipes to distributors, and then distributors are allocating them to customers, which would be the dental offices. And it seems that liquid disinfectant is more readily available than the wipes. So can you make your own wipes? This is the big hot debate. You can use the spray wipe spray technique so you have the liquid in a spray bottle, you spray your surface, wipe it, spray it again, and let it sit for the recommended contact time. Um, you cannot pre-make wipes with two by twos or four by fours because the cotton in that will react with the disinfectant and it will render it useless. It's no longer disinfecting anything, okay? So don't pre-make wipes with four by fours. I know it's super handy. If you have to use the spray, use a spray wipe spray technique, even though it's not recommended because of aerosols, right now we're in that crisis capacity stage. So if you have to use something, spray wipe spray is better. Um, I have seen offices make wipes out of like paper towels instead of the cotton four by fours. I think that's appropriate on a small scale as long as you're not making them for the whole week and then letting them sit all week. You know, make them up for everything before lunch and then at lunch make a new batch, that's totally fine. Um, if we talk about PPE extended use, right now masks are the big thing. So we talked a little bit before about crisis capacity. You don't have the masks or the respirators. There are strategies out there to help you extend the use. So things like wearing your face shield with your mask or your respirator keeps all that spray and spatter off the outside of the mask and respirator. And then when you go to come out of your room and where you would normally change your mask, you change your face shield instead of your mask before you go into the next room. And you just don't touch your mask. Your mask is part of your face, leave it on. 
and just change your face shield between patients or wipe your face shield off. You can go to the next slide. This is just a little conversion chart that I got from a really good friend. So it kind of goes over um, the conversion of wipes and how much liquid disinfectant is in a can of wipes. So one can of wipes of any brand wipes is about a 24 ounce bottle of that same liquid. So if you're using Cabicide or Optum One and you can get the liquid, 24 ounce bottle should be about as much as you would get in one canister. And if you wanna play with the big dogs, you can get the two and a half gallon bottle and roll with that. All right, do we have questions on PPE? I've been talking and not watching the chat, I apologize. No, but Paula said, thank you for clarifying the pre-made wipes. It's, she's on a crusade like we are to make yes. sure, right? <laughs> yes. Um, and you guys, I, I don't have a handy that I can drop into the chat, but if you go on the CDC, you can find um, an article that talks about uh, why the cotton breaks down the, um, the chemical and the, um, the disinfectants and everything. So you can find that. I'm sorry, I, I forgot to get that link for you. Yeah, that's okay. We can maybe post it in the group after we're done. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah, I'll do, yeah. we'll do that. Um, so Tyler wants to know, what about wearing the bouffants? So, you know, I told you guys to go watch my video on the ADA because mm -hmm. I have this cute little pink hat on. So um, he says they wear a blue font for each procedure. Some of the residents are not wearing them. What does the CDC recommend? So right now the CDC is not recommending any hair coverings. Um, you know, it's kind of standard practice, especially in oral surgery because you're working in that sterile field environment to wear a, a hair covering or a head cap. But as far as COVID precautions go, CDC doesn't recommend hair coverings. Um, if you are wearing those hair coverings or scrub caps or bouffants, make sure that you're doffing them properly because they are a part of your PPE and they do get dirty. So when you're taking it off, make sure you're not getting dirty everywhere. True that. I got to tell you, man, I, I think that I should have been wearing them forever because, you know, I have this crazy hair and I can remember going home and there's puffy paste, there's a oh, yeah. of pieces, yep. there's all kind of crap in my hair. And I'm thinking Little pieces of a tooth when you get right, home. Yep. Right. Like everything is in your hair. So, and so I was thinking, wow, I should have been wearing this all along. And, you know, now you can get some cute little ones. They're like really um, fashionable for us mm -hmm. right now. Right. That's awesome. Yeah. And another thing, um, if you are going to wear those scrub caps, a lot of people are selling buttons on them back here is ear savers for their masks, mm -hmm. which helps if your ears are sore. It does. And I have some pictures of that for you guys in just a minute. So uh, thanks, uh, Tyler, for that question or that comment. I do really appreciate it. And then Paula says that OSAP and um, the RDH magazine has articles on the four by fours also. So those are really helpful. I think that there's basically right now, there's so much information. Um, you, you know, you want to make sure that you get your, uh, your information from a reliable source, right? Please don't follow Facebook for that stuff. <laughs> Go to the CDC. After you spend some time on there, you'll learn how to um, search. And um, the cdc.gov, you can go to OSAP, OSAP.org. And OSAP is an amazing um, resource for anything, really anything at all infection control. You can trust what they say. Um, there's a science behind it. And they're not going to just say, well, because Cherie says, right? They're going to send you links and they're going to send you all the information that you need for that. So, gosh, that's really great. And I also... Um... I don't know how many of you out there watching are in the ADAA Facebook group, but I try to post a lot of resources as well. Mm -hmm. So a lot of reliable resources, not just like a, you said, oh, here's a meme of somebody wearing a mask, right? But, you know, I post resources, I post templates of stuff uh -huh. and articles that are relevant to what we have going on. So there's a lot of good information in there too. And I'll continue to post that as well. I run across that information 
every day as an infection preventionist. And every time I find something that relates to dentistry like that, I try to post it to share it with the world. You do. And I got to tell you, I have been using your post <laughs> to answer things. I'm like, hey, Sarah answered that. I'm just going to go grab it and answer, you know, use the resource yep. and answer the question. So that's, that's what awesome. it's there for. I know, Absolutely. right? Awesome. Well, thank you. I don't see any more questions in here at this time, but uh, once again, you guys keep chatting with us uh, and let us know what your questions are. We're there to help us. So I'm going to talk to you about respirators and infection control. I'm not infection control and the user seal check. So I think that we, um, as a group, as a as an industry, you know, respirators are new for us. We've been protecting ourselves since, oh, I don't want to say the early 80s, right, that we've been protecting ourselves with masks and gloves and, uh, you know, our jackets, our snorkels, our fins, we've been, get, we've been getting it done. But a respirator is a brand new um, PPE for us as an industry. Now, there are some people that already have been using respirators, and they're normally in a hospital setting or whatever. Sometimes if you have patients that have a high um, respiratory infection population, I guess would be the way you may have already been reusing them. But general dentistry, it is fairly new to us. So uh, I'm going to talk to you about that kind of stuff. So my, my objectives with you tonight are talk about this uh, OCEAN CDC guidelines for use of those things. We're going to talk about what respirators are common use in dentistry. I really want to spend some time on the user seal check. And then we're going to talk about storage and disposal of those respirators. So the um, CDC is stated to, like Sarah said, to use the highest level of protection possible, right? And when you can't get the highest level, then the face shield, the level three and a face shield is appropriate. Now, most states are saying they're going with that guideline. There is a couple of states out there, um, Texas, and I want to say Colorado, and I hope that one's right, that their state board has mandated that they used to, they need to wear a respirator for all their um, aerosol generating procedures, right? But uh, most other states, you have the choice to do what you think is best for you. Um, but if you are going to use a respirator, then OSHA has mandated that you need to have fit testing and do a user seal check, right? That's mandated by OSHA. That is not a new law. That has been in effect since the early 1991 or 92, somewhere around in there. And uh, OSHA made their mandates based on, not dentistry, obviously, because it's new to us, but they made this mandate based on uh, just respirator use across the, all the industries that use it. Now, prior to have fit testing, then the other component from the OSHA uh, requirement is that each person who wears a respirator needs to have medical evaluation prior to wearing that tight fitting respirator. So part of that deal is to have your medical evaluations. Now, Obviously, we had pandemic hit, we all started wearing respirators and kind of we got our cart and horse a little bit backwards with this. You can go to the next slide, please. Um, but you know, there's, we, we do have a way to make this happen and um, we're just catching up right now. So there are common respirators that are, are used in dentistry. And you'll notice the, the ones that are on, I'm hoping that it's my left here, that have the exhalation valves on those. Those guys are really good for um, protecting the, the wearer because it doesn't let anything pass to the wearer. So uh, asbestos removal, people who work like in um, high vapor environments like paint booths and those kinds of things, they can wear those respirators. Those types are not good for healthcare because it does not protect my patient from me, right? So we need our mask to protect both ways. I want to protect myself from the patient, but I also want to protect the patient from me. So those, those uh, valve respirators are not appropriate for healthcare. The other three that you see on there are just different styles of respirators. Now, right now, there's, um, there's actually, there's more different styles. I've got three laying right here on my desk to show and tell for you. Um, but they're all, they're all different and because they're coming from all over the world, right? So right now um, in the pandemic, our uh, respirators need to be NIOSH approved, right? So, but during the pandemic, that requirement has been relaxed. 
because we are getting all these respirators from all over the world and there's no way for NIOSH to have been approving all of them. So they do have a list though. So if you go on the CDC, um, cdc.org or .gov, and then you'll be able to just put respirators in the search bar and it will bring you up to a list that you can find and go through it and make sure that the, the um, brand that you're buying or the brand that you're using are have an approval. They need to be on the list of a, um, an acceptable manufacturer because there's a lot of counterfeit going on out there, okay? So in um, the employees, everybody has to be tested using the exact respirator that you're going to be using, um, the brand, the make, and the size. So you have to be tested with those things. Now, um, you can go to the next slide. Sometimes though, there's, uh, you can't get those tight fitting respirators and there's another type of respirator called a PAPR. I really want this one because it's like having your own air conditioning stuck on your head, right? This thing is the bomb. You use a little, um, it gets a motor, I guess, that goes attaches to a belt on your back. So it, it has air generating that it puts a positive pressure into the mask. Because this is not tight fitting, you don't need to have any, um, it doesn't have to be fit tested. However, in that it's a uh, air conditioning on your head is really great, but the cost is about $2,500 a piece, right? So it's a little bit cost uh, prohibitive to use in the dental office, but it is an option out there if you have some people on there. So uh, there are some ways though that Sarah had mentioned that the CDC has recommended that we can um, optimize our supplies right now because you know, the uh, it's hard, stuff is hard to get, it's horribly expensive, all this kinds of things. So I wanna spend a little bit of time on the summary of the respirator supply organization strategies. So these guys, um, you can go to the next one. These guys are um, just ways to help. And Sarah has already said that uh, there are some different things to do it. And that takes one more click on there, Peter. So the first thing are engineering controls. We want to make sure that we are um, maximizing our supply by doing some things in our offices. So the first thing is so we wanna put patients that are suspected COVID in an isolation room. So because we don't normally have uh, positive pressure rooms in our um, op operatories, we wanna keep them as isolated as possible, right? So the next thing is you wanna use barriers between the patients. Um, most of the time, if your room is like, if you have a total open bay, like an uh, ortho uh, practice or something like that, I've seen them are using shower curtains on PVC as just like a temporary barrier between the chairs, anything to help to reduce the airflow that goes between the patients. Other times they are um, trying to stagger your operatories if you have uh, multiples that you can use. So you'll use one and three, and then the next time you'll use two and four, that kind of stuff, just to minimize the airflow and the, um, the overspray that goes behind them. The other thing about an engineering control is your ventilation system. So um, as, a, as a rule of thumb, a lot of us, we're so busy taking care of our infection control, we're cleaning our instruments and everything, we forget about the air conditioning filters, right? So you may need to have uh, one, a little higher HEPA value on your air conditioning filter for your building. So you might wanna get a better HEPA uh, filter on that, but mainly you wanna change it more often. So if it says that it needs to be changed every month, then you need to change it a month and don't let it go any longer than that because then it will starts to lose its effectiveness, right? So engineering controls are really, really important. The next thing are some administrative controls. So these would be things that we are already doing now, uh, but these things also help to, pre to uh, preserve our PPE. The first thing is pre-screening our patients. I think every office that I have in my organization is um, talking to them on the phone before they come in. And then they're also um, pre-screening like out, go out to the car and give them their paperwork and all those kinds of things, texting back and forth, doing all those sorts of things. The other thing is use the teledentistry. Teledentistry is like, holy cow, doctors have been doing this for a long time. So why can't a dentist, right? So you can do all things of, cons of consults and things that people would normally just come in to see. You can do consults. I love teledentistry for follow-ups, especially post-ops. 
after somebody has had surgery or even after you just seated a crown today. How cool is that to do a little bit of video call and co talk to somebody who had a crown seat to say, hey, does it feel like it's part of your body now, you know? But just having those follow-ups and those post-op calls doing teledentistry is amazing. The next thing uh, that's administrative control is make sure you have proper training. And like Sarah said, it's all about how you don and doff that respirator, right? It's contaminated. The first time you put it on, it's nice and clean, you're good to go. But you wear that thing for five, 10 minutes, it's contaminated. So now you need to make sure that you are properly training your team members on how to don and doff them. And then the other thing for administrative controls is to adopt extended use practices. Now we're gonna kind of go into that just a little bit, but those are a couple of the things that would help. You can go to the next slide. Can I just um, ask something really quick, Sheree? Yeah. I am sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. That's okay, just, I'm on a roll, go. <laughs> going back to the donning and doffing thing, I think it's important to note too that, you know, we are all stressed out. Healthcare fatigue is a real thing. It, it really is. is. And I think that it's important for your team to have each other's back. I know, you know, I went on site to do an infection control audit in a facility and my team members who do PPE for a living, this is what we do every day and this is our specialty. We stood outside the facility and we just double checked each other. Is your mask on right? Do you have, you know, is your face shield on right? Is everything looking okay? Are you protected? And it's not because we're trying to shame anybody or say, hey, you're doing that wrong. It's because we care about our safety yeah. and we care about their safety. So I think that if you have that mentality in your team, especially when it comes to donning and doffing, you know, have, have trainings often. Everybody starts to, you know, you get complacent and mm -hmm. you, I walked around with a mask under my chin when it was a dirty mask before. I am very guilty of that, but I think now more than ever, we need, <laughs> we need to. I can firm the ear like this, right? Yep. Yeah, I worked with a doctor who would put his cone mask on top of his head and go eat his lunch. Oh. <laughs> so I think having having a team that has each other's back, you know, if, if you see somebody that's not doesn't have the respirator on properly, just stop and tell them because it's about everybody's safety. It's not about being punitive or somebody doing something wrong. Um, so yeah, that was my spiel. Go ahead. <laughs> I appreciate that spiel because you are 100% right. And I think thing, uh, some things like I saw somebody um, on a call actually, and they had their level three mask on and then the respirator on top of it. They didn't know they had it backwards, right? And to be honest, if you put this level three underneath your respirator, your respirator is not doing you any good because it doesn't seal, right? So I think that helping to educate each other, um, having their back say, hey, let me help you out here. Let's, just, let's get this so you're more protected, right? Um, so the other thing that CDC has recommended is says use the respirators identified by the CDC as performing adequately for healthcare. Now this is a really important words right there. And that's where it goes back to that NIOSH approved, right? So if they're NIOSH approved, then that means that um, our government is the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, right? So those guys have gone ahead and um, my little 3M mask I have here has a NIOSH symbol on it and it has been approved. Now, once again, we, so we're in a pandemic, so we have to get what we can, right? And so respirators from other countries are similar to this. If they have a N95 rating and they're, they're different, they come from another country, those are still approved also. But just go to that uh, listing that you'll find on the CDC for the companies that are um, been vetted to know that they're not doing counterfeit things. That list yeah. is actually on the FDA website. Oh, thank you. I apologize. I will find that link and put it in the comments right now. Oh, you're at the bomb, girl. Um, I love having a techie person on the team. It just makes everything so much easier, right? That's awesome. Um, and then implement uh, limited reuse options. So, so there's a couple of reuses that you could do. You can go to the next slide, please. Um, and those are to, uh, uh, you know, do use a limited or use an extended wear. But I'll, I'm going to show you that in just a second. So 
there are some requirements, like I said, before you use the fit testing, I mean, before you use the respirators. And the first one is the fit testing. Obviously, I don't have time to go into fit testing with you guys right now, but if you want to uh, reach out, I'm happy to, to talk to you about that. But fit testing is exactly what it says. It's making sure that you're testing to make sure that this respirator fits you appropriately so that you are protected as much as you want, right? So um, the other thing from after the fit testing or really every time, I guess, is to make sure you're doing a user seal check. This is really more important I shouldn't probably say it that way, but equally as important as your fit testing. Because if your user seal check, if you can't pass that, then your, um, your, your field test is not going to pass, right? So you want to make sure that you have your uh, user seal check that to be do, to on that. It has to be done every single time you put that mask on. So the user seal check is extra important when you're using um, extended wear because after time, you're gonna be wearing this respirator, right? And if you're anything like me, this is why I want the papper because it's air conditioning. This puppy gets hot. It gets sweaty where it's touching my skin. I sneezed in it three times yesterday, you know, those kind of things. So it takes some wear on the inside of it, not, not even counting the wear that it gets on the outside of it, right? So my user seal check is going to make sure that every time I put that respirator on, that it is fitting me properly, okay? So um, it's because my video is really small, it's a little difficult for me to explain that. So I do have a video for this. So hopefully he's going to do it. We're going to watch how that works. Your N95 respirator only protects you if it fits properly. Before you wear it for the first time, your institution's designated fit tester will perform a fit test. After that, a user seal check must be performed each time you put on an N95 to check that it is donned correctly. You can check the seal of your N95 with a positive or negative for the first pressure time, test. Your Always follow the manufacturer's user seal check instructions for the specific model of your N95. As not all N95s can be checked using both positive and negative pressure. If the N95 has an exhalation valve, the seal cannot be checked using positive pressure and it could expose the patient to a virus if you are an asymptomatic carrier. So it is not recommended for use. To begin your user seal check, cover the surface of the N95 with your hands so air is prevented from passing through the face piece filter. For a positive pressure seal check, gently exhale and feel if the face piece bulges slightly. If you do not feel the face piece bulge a little, the respirator may not fit properly. For a negative pressure seal check, cover as much of the face piece filter with your hands as possible, quickly inhale and feel if the face piece collapses slightly. If the face piece does not collapse, the respirator may not fit properly. During the positive and negative pressure tests, if you can feel air moving through the seal across your face or eyes, then readjust the fit of your respirator and check the seal again. A proper seal of your respirator prevents air from leaking between the face and the face seal. If you cannot achieve a proper seal, you are not protected and should not enter a hazardous area. N95s come in different forms, varying by the manufacturer and brand. All N95s are tested and certified by the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health and filter at least 95% of airborne particles, but are not resistant to oil. Surgical N95s are also approved as a surgical mask by the Food and Drug Administration. You might be issued an N95 that is different from what you normally use due to supply issues. You may not be fit tested for your new mask, but you should always do a user seal check for yourself. I love that part that they said you may not always get fit tested, but you can always do your user seal check. This is the part that will keep you the safest and to provide the protection that you're depending on that um, mask to provide. So I have my little one here and I know that it's difficult to see, but this mask, this is the, um, the 3M 
N95 one from a uh, NIOSH approved and everything. This mask, when you do it, you may not see it move. That's why you put your hands over it so you can feel if it's moving. So when you take a deep breath in, you should feel that mask collapse towards your face. If you take a deep push, like breathe out uh, sharply, you should feel it like expand a little bit. You want to make sure that you don't have any air leaking all the way around. Now, as clinicians, and I, I started teaching this, and I'm like, seriously, I do that all the time, right? The first thing you do when you pick up your mask is we're going to bend the nose, and then we're going to stick it on like this, right? We always just bend our nose. So when you're putting on your respirator, you want to make sure that you have your the inside, that it's nice and flat in here. Don't bend it. When you do bend it like that, it creates a little um, V at the top of your bridge of your nose, right on the top here. So what happens is that is the place where the air will leak in. And because when you're doing a fit test, especially that mist is so fine that it goes all inside the hood. So the mist can get under the top of your nose and go in so you can taste it, right? So just make sure that when you put this on, you want to start at the bridge of your nose and then push it flat and then mold it around your nose tightly. Do if you wear eyeglasses, take your glasses off when you're putting that on there, okay? You can go to the next slide. So uh, if you need some written instructions, then if you just want to Google um, user seal check, it will bring up the CDC, uh, the CDC one. Please follow the instructions on the CDC, although I got to tell you, um, Crosstex, uh, 3M, and there's another company that does really, uh, they have good resources. They're all free. All you have to do is do a little Google search and you'll find some great ones, okay? So um, I like this document, especially because it's straight from the CDC from the horse's mouth. So Sarah was saying earlier that you could do some things to help the mask uh, stay tighter. One of them is to put the, the um, buttons on our headband. You can also use, I love the barrel of monkeys. I thought that was the funnest one to do at all. It's just to keep it tighter. And then um, there's some things that are 3D printed that you can get. This little mask uh, with the rubber bands, you can see you can put a knot in it and that'll make it a little bit tighter for you. All else fails, a paper clip is in every office drawer in the planet, right? So a paper clip will really do it well too. You do have to be careful about making it too tight, right? Because the seal needs to go flat. This seal right here needs to go flat around your face. So it needs to be flat. When you make it too tight, it had the seal will have a tendency to twist backwards like this a little bit, and that will break it. So you want to make sure that this, the, the edges of the mask lay flat against your face, and then that really will help you. Um, there's also, so you want to take care of, like we talked about it before, um, Sarah said that you, we have some extended or limited uses. So an extended use would be that you're going to have one mask that you're going to wear for a week, right? So you would take this and at that point you want to put a, a, a surgical mask over. Now, it is not necessary. This mask gives you the filtration. This mask gives you the waterproofing because this is not waterproof. It's not moisture proof, right? So that's what you're protecting yourself from. You do not need a level three mask over this respirator. You're just trying to protect it from moisture. So you want to save your level three mask for when you're actually uh, working. If you run out of respirators, then you may need your level three over a level one. But a level one or a level two mask, which is a lot easier to come by, you can put over your respirator. That will give you that waterproofing that you're looking for. The other way that you can use is limited uses. So that one is, I'm going to wear, I'm going to have five masks. This mask I'm going to wear on Monday. And then I'm going to take it off carefully because now it's contaminated. So I'm going to make sure that I don't touch the outside. Or if I do touch the outside, then I'm using my gloves. But I'm going to take it and then I'm going to drop it into a paper bag and then put my name on it and let it sit on the shelf for a week. So there's no time that's, there's no documentation that says how long to let it sit on the shelf. There but, is. Oh, is there? Yeah. Thank so, you. Yeah, no problem. CDC is recommending that if you're doing the, this brown bag method, that you wait at least 72 hours between uses. Oh, there you go. I thought yep. it was about three, three days. Yeah, um, three so, days. 
yeah, three to five days um, is been the norm that everybody's been doing it. Um, so if you're gonna wait for three days, obviously you may need to have at least two uh, of these masks that you're gonna rotate. It needs that long really to dry, right? Like I said, I sneezed in mine twice yesterday. So it's gotta have some time to dry out. So, but just do that, put it in a paper bag with your name on it. Now I have saw this uh, fun hack on Facebook uh, a couple of weeks ago where a girl took hers and put it in a Tupperware like a Rubbermaid or whatever, you know, um, and that's great, except that if you put it in plastic, it can't breathe and dry. So you want to have some holes into your plastic so that you can have some air circulation. Make sure not to touch it on the outside. It's contaminated and then put it in that bag with your name on it. And uh, here's the deal about how long you can use it for. Okay. This is why you need your user seal check. You are the only one who can say when that mask goes in the trash. You are the only one that can say, okay, I can't breathe in this anymore. So you just wear it until it's difficult to breathe when you don it or it doesn't seal properly. Um, most of the time, um, we kind of, in my company, we put them in biohazard, but I have heard other people say that you can just put them in the trash. I think it's gross. I'm going to go in the biohazard myself. But that's well, as long as it's you. not dripping and bloody, it doesn't have yes. to go in biohazard. So you're right. So uh, that's up to you, however you want to dispose, but dispose of it properly and make sure that when you're putting it in the trash, that somebody doesn't go back digging through there. That's just kind of gross. Okay, next slide. Um, any questions so far? I think I do have a couple of questions that I put on here. Uh, the first one was how long does it last? And like I said, it's until you decide that it's too hard to breathe through. And then this was a great big question. They said, I can smell through the respirator. Does that mean it's not working? Well, no. It means it doesn't mean that at all. The respirator not uh, um, takes out 95 or 95 microns. I guess that's the word. But the particles that are fragrance are much smaller, right? So fragrance can go through there, so you will be able to smell. Um, so you want to make sure that you're you're um, when you're doing that. If you're doing a fit test, it's all about the taste. And then here's the big one. How do I clean the respirator? Because I've seen all kinds of things. People are putting them in crock pots. They're trying to run them through the autoclave. They're doing some um, alcohol smell or vapors or whatever, whatever. These guys are disposable. They're not intended to be autoclaved or anything like that. The only thing that we can do is put them in the bag and let them sit there for a minimum of three days, right? So on that note, there was a question that came through the chat about the UV light boxes for disinfecting the respirators. So UV, those UV light boxes that are specifically made for this are effective, but you have to make sure that there is no shadowing on the mask, which can be difficult when you get the small ones that look like a little toaster oven. You know, mm -hmm. there's, there is no way you can put your mask if there's not a shadow somewhere. Okay, so you need to be careful of that. There are also, um, I know many states have disinfectant stations for respirators. So like here in the Omaha area, there are three different facilities. You can take your respirators there and they'll disinfect them for you and you can go pick them up and they'll be sterilized. That's what they're doing right now to help. So if you're in that situation, that may be a good thing to look at if you have any of those facilities near you that are doing that UV disinfection for respirators. That's awesome. That's the only thing that's approved really is the UV. Is that right? Yeah, but you have yeah. to do it properly. Um, yeah. We went and toured the, their UV disinfectant station at UNMC here in Omaha, and they have four big UV light towers in this room, and all of the walls are painted with UV reflective paint. So those masks are getting it from every direction. There is no shadowing, and it's been proven to sterilize those masks. That's awesome. How much is the cost for that? Right now, they're doing it free of charge. You just drop them off, hey. and process them, and then come pick them back up. Yep. So it's a part of the pandemic response here. Hey, that's pretty awesome. I feel a road trip to Omaha coming on yeah. here, right? Bring that's all your awesome. respirators. <laughs> I know, right? Bring them on down. We'll take them in and get them done. Yep. That's pretty awesome. Um, okay. There's also, oh, I'm sorry. I know we're, we're running short on time. There was also a question on NIOSH approved versus FDA approved. So I wanted to touch on that too. Go ahead. Um, so NIOSH is the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, and they are who normally approve medical use respirators for us. 
But during the pandemic, the FDA issues what's called an emergency use authorization, the EUA. So the FDA issues those EUAs just for emergency use. And that's that list that I posted in the comments. So if you go to the FDA website, it has the list of all of the respirators. You can search by your manufacturer and model number and find out if your respirator is on that, if it's not already been approved. A lot of the KN95 masks from China that were approved in the beginning, they started off with a list of 80 something approved KN95s, we're down to 24. Mm -hmm. So if you got KN95s from somewhere in March, you may wanna check your list to make sure they are FDA approved now. That's awesome. Hey, we do have one other, um, one other question here from Paula. How does the UV, I'm hoping this is what she's asking. How does the UV process restore the breathability? The breathe, you know what I'm trying to say. I do, breathability. <laughs> yes, so the UV process doesn't restore breathability. So the, what happens with breathability in a respirator like that is because of the fibers are so tightly woven and they filter out so much junk you know, they're filtering out obviously the viruses and the bacteria that we could potentially breathing in, but there's dust, there's dander in the air, you know, there's all kinds of stuff that's floating around that gets caught in those respirators and eventually they will get clogged up and it can affect the breathability. The UV doesn't fix that. It only kills what's on there. So mm -hmm. every respirator still has a hard life. You cannot use it after a certain point because it will get clogged up, the rubber bands will get stretched out, you can't get a good seal. And actually most rec most manufacturers recommend that you don't wear them more than five times. So if you're doing that brown paper bag, I know a lot of um, a lot of facilities mark a tally mark on their respirator, on their mask, how many times have you worn it? And when you get to five, you need to start like really looking at it to make sure it's still in good shape. So Amanda has a question. So the ones that are NIOSH approved, but not for medical or surgical use by the label may be approved in this list. So if NIOSH has approved them, but they are not approved for medical use by NIOSH, they could be on that FDA mm -hmm. EUA list. Those are okay. the ones that you need to go look for to make sure that they're appropriate. Right. Um, you know, I know for sure, there's a, a Honeywell mask that's going around that is not approved for medical use and it's not on the list, but there are facilities that are still trying to use it because it's the only thing they can get, which yeah. unfortunately is is the state of where we're at right now. And in the long run, anything's better than nothing right now, you know, even um, if it's not approved for medical use. Yeah, but, true that. Um, you know, we need to make sure we're at least giving it our best shot of checking on those things and making sure they are appropriate because at the end of the day, you're protecting yourself, you're protecting your family, you're protecting your patients. Um, you know, it's, it's a scary world out there right now. Nobody knows what's happening. Yeah. And it's so unpredictable. Sorry, guys, mm -hmm. my power, just like my computer said, I'm going to die. So I'm like, Oh, I better plug that puppy oh, in. Dear. I know. Right. So, um, and I think that the only thing about the non-medical use ones are that exhalation valve. So I've seen there some non-medical use ones that are an N95 that's not approved for medical use mm -hmm. that doesn't have an exhalation valve. It looks right. just like the regular N95. Looks just like the regular. Yeah. But if you read the IFU's instructions for use, it says do not use in a medical setting. This will not protect you against viruses and bacteria and can result in death. And so <laughs> You know, it's it's those that you worry about because people think that, you know, oh, it's okay, it's an N95. Well, it's not been approved. It's not been tested for this. Right. I do have to say, too, I've had to call the FDA a few times, and <laughs> I think they got extra help on their phones because they're pretty good with it right now. Yeah. They answer pretty fast, and they give you good advice. So reach out to them. Um, all right, so do you guys have any other questions? I don't see anything else that we haven't um, talked about in the chat. I know that we're over our time, but I, I just don't... have one more quick thing, Sheree. Okay, I'm go. Sorry, everybody. I know we're past we're past our time, we but are. I think this is important. So, with the KN95 masks that you know they have come over from China, look, Sheree's got KN95 masks. So, those particular masks are very common right now in dentistry. But 
you need to realize that the KN95s, you don't require a seal check, uh, initial fit test. And because most of them have the ear loops and they don't go around your head, you're not gonna get as good of a seal with them. And when they test those masks in China, they test them for inhalation protection and not for exhalation. So it's going to protect you when you're breathing in, but it's not going to protect everybody else when you exhale. Okay, so a lot of times when you wear those masks, if you try to do the user seal check, you're not gonna get a seal on exhalation. Right. But you should get it on inhalation. You should that's get right. it on inhalation. Yeah, that's what you're looking for to protect yourself. And then these ear loops, those are the ones that the um, the paper clips and all those mm -hmm. rubber band things work really well for that. You can also yep. put a knot on the end. It makes it a little uncomfortable uh, when it's behind the ear. So if you want to put the knot like closer to the edge versus behind your ear, it will be a little bit more comfortable for that. So, wow, we didn't even know there's so much information about there's rest. There's so much stuff out there. Right? There's so many things to know. Um, and I appreciate having my 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 infection control buddy there with to, to say that. So that's really, I want to thank you guys for hanging out with us and, um, and being able to uh, uh, answer the questions and have this time. Please, 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 please. If you've, if you've liked this video, or even if you're just okay with this video, like it and share it, right, please? Because the more people who see that we're really trying to give uh, accurate uh, information out there, and so people are, we don't want them to get all of their information just from Facebook pages, uh, but go to reputable places. So you guys, please like us, share us, um, come back and watch us again with your friends and neighbors. We just really appreciate it. We're gonna do this yeah. again. So keep watching um, the ADAAUSA.org pages and um, we will be coming to you again soon. You guys have a great time. Don't forget, don't forget to go to that membership promotion link so we can, oh, yeah. you can get your membership with a $25 discount. And this video will be available on the Facebook page and under the videos when we're done. So if you missed it or if you wanna share it with somebody else, we're also going to upload it to our YouTube page. So you can find it there also. Rock on. Okay. Come find us and like us and share us. Thanks, guys. Have a great night. Bye. Bye.